Good morning. A warm welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum, to those joining us on Zoom and to those joining us on Facebook. My name is Ray Sunby, president of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a secular and reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the humanist community if you have not yet done so. Membership forms are available on our website at humanists.org. A special welcome to those who are with us for the first time. We invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find all our other events listed on the website, humanists.org. Please aid us in continuing to present these forums by donating to the humanist community. You can find out how to donate to our organization on our website, humanists.org. Um, good morning, I'm Alex Havasey, I'm Vice President of the Humanist Community. Um, our program today will end at 12.15, Q&A will follow um, and end at 12.30. If you'd like to ask a question or make a brief comment, you can either raise your, your hand, use the raise hand feature on uh, the, the uh, bottom of your Zoom screen, or you can ask your, I'm sorry, I'm getting messages on top of what I'm reading. Um, Uh, yeah, to raise your hand, click on the reaction button found at the bottom of your screen and click the raise hand button at the bottom of the, of, of, of the menu. Um, if you leave your hand raised, you'll be called on when it's your turn. Uh, once you're called on, you can unmute yourself and be heard. After Q&A, the forum will be open to uh, for general discussion and all uh, those on Zoom can unmute themselves when they want to talk. Again, to prevent any background that noise that may uh, uh, come up at your location um, from interfering with discussion, you're encouraged to mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, you can change your name on the Zoom meeting if you want to remain anonymous. Um, okay, uh, does anyone have any announcements they'd like to make? Let me... Uh, Raise your hand. I don't see anyone. All right. Um, okay. Um, our speaker today is uh, uh, John Seeger. He's president and CN CEO of the Population Connection. Uh, before joining Population Connection, John worked at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He's a veteran of uh, 50 plus political campaigns. John served as the chief of staff for a former congressman from Pennsylvania. John will discuss the vital connection between population growth, social justice, and environmental, and environmental challenges and women's rights. Um, so John, you, you're on. So on thank, you, thank, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, it, uh, my commute today was about 14 steps from my living room upstairs. Uh, so the traffic wasn't too bad today. Uh, you know, I have a secular uh, formulation for you in terms of time, uh, but it uses some old initials. Uh, I divide time into two categories, BC and AD. BC means before COVID and AD means after Donald. Uh, so those are my new formulations. Back uh, BC, uh, before COVID, I spent much of my time traveling around the country, talking to people, uh, spoke on uh, 85 college campuses, uh, some of them many times all across the country. And I also got to speak, was honored to speak once at the American Humanist uh, National Conference in Colorado. And when I speak to college students, I'm often asked to speak to science classes and you come into a class and there are always some students who got their heads down and they got their their pens out or their notebooks and they're busily writing down everything you say. And I, I prefer to have a little more interaction. So sometimes I'll open up with a line such as the following. And by the way, I stole this from Dick Cavett. Those of you who remember Dick Cavett, uh, I say, you know, there's some 
breaking news in terms of genetics uh, that we need to know, and that is that the ability, it turns out, the ability to have children is hereditary. If your parents didn't have any, you probably won't either. Uh, at that point, the students tend to put their pens down and realize that they shouldn't be writing. Uh, and anyway, I share my presentation with them. So as we go along, if, if anybody wants to uh, raise anything, please feel free to do so. I'm going to see if I can get to my, I'm going to inflict some slides on this innocent audience. I hope, I hope you can, I hope you can see that. Uh, usually I can see people as well. I'm not sure where the people went. There you are. Anyway, I think we're good. Uh, are you, are you seeing my screen at the moment? Okay, good. Yes. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I use the word inalienable, <clears throat> the rights way to meet population challenges on our pl crowded planet. Uh, most of, we're all familiar with the words of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator, not a God, just their creator, well, everything came, you know, however it came about, a lot of deists, a lot of secularists back then, uh, with certain inalienable rights. What's kind of interesting, uh, I can't say that my encounters with geometry in high school were particularly happy for me or my teacher, but in geometry, uh, that work is based on Euclid, and Jefferson was familiar with the writings of Euclid, and he drew his formulation from Euclid when he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, which I think are the most important words uh, written in the last thousand years, perhaps. By self-evident, he, he said, they don't come from God. They're not coming from the king. They're not even coming from science, which is kind of interesting. What he was doing was he was putting forward an axiom just like you do in geometry. He's saying, we are going to advance this axiom that people are created equal, et cetera. And now the task upon us is to go out and prove it, just like one must construct a proof in geometry. And we're a couple of hundred years into it, and some days it looks like we're doing a good job on the proof, and sometimes it looks like we're failing miserably. But when it comes to addressing population, as I hope to be able to show, the key to doing it is to focus on rights. Uh, the photo you see here is one of those BC photos of uh, a lot of uh, young people that we brought to DC as we did every year until COVID hit, we'd bring hundreds of them. And uh, if you can take a look at the picture, I think it's a, a really pleased and proud of the picture. We were able to re recruit a very diverse group of young people uh, a lot, lot of uh, more. The one way area where we're a little shortcoming in terms of diversity, I would say 80 to 90 percent of the young people who seem to be attracted to these programs are women. Uh, but certainly within that cohort, we have many black and brown faces. And, and that's certainly true across the board within our organization. The chairman of our board, the chair of our board is a, uh, a woman uh, who works on health issues in New York, who's a Dominican American. And I think it's very important for us to reach out and expand the audience uh, of participants and also make sure that we're providing leadership opportunities for people who don't all look like me, frankly. About a month ago, my wife and I, we haven't, it's really the first trip of any note that we've taken. I live in Pennsylvania. We drove up to New England and we drove during the trip through Vermont. And what you see here is a photo from then, uh, we didn't take it, but it's a photo from that time a month or so ago. And if you look in the far background, you see a very dark shape. That's Mount Mansfield, the highest peak in Vermont. Vermont is the green mountain state. The mountains were not green. The mountains were gray all through the state. They were gray because of the Western wildfires, thousands of miles away turn the sky gray. You could even smell the smoke. And this is what we're doing to our planet now. This, this is certainly anybody who lives in California sees evidence of this all the time. You really can't not see it because of the things that you can't see. And, and it's plain before our eyes what we're doing to this, this planet at this point.
if you look at it, and I'm sorry to inflict facts and figures on people at this, on, on, on this day, but nonetheless, if, if you look at the rate over there on the left of global carbon emissions from fossil fuels uh, over this past uh, 110 years, you can see it's steadily risen. If you look on the right, uh, the chart to the right purports to show the sources. 25% uh, from electricity heat production, 14% from transportation, 24% from agriculture. The chart is both accurate and in one ex to one extent, um, not entirely helpful because what it overlooks is who's behind all of that and who's behind it is us, it's people. The biggest sector is really left off there. And in fact, in terms of addressing climate change, the science tells us that addressing population growth can be the single most powerful way, the single most impactful way in hard numbers in terms of reducing climate impacts. And yet, unfortunately, very few organizations will talk about it for various reasons. I don't want to impugn the many outstanding environmental organizations in the United States that do great work, but when it comes to population, they're silent generally on the topic. And that's unfortunate because I think they're, they're overlooking something that I believe is very important to their cause. Uh, so, you know, there's still a little room left. If you want to go to the beach, you can see there is a spot in the near foreground there where you could probably wedge yourself in and enjoy a quite peaceful day at the shore. I don't want to pick on these nice people who, uh, who are trying to have a, a pleasant day off, but personally, I prefer it when it isn't quite as crowded. Uh, when I go to a park or a beach or take a walk, I never find myself saying, you know, this is a nice spot. I just sure wish there were more people here right now. Uh, that's fine maybe for a sporting event or a concert, but with nature, I think we prefer to enjoy it with a little solitude. Now looking again at the CO2 emissions on the right, going back several hundred years, isn't it interesting how the chart for CO2 emissions is basically, for all practical purposes, the same as the chart for world population, these things are operating in tandem. Uh, one is related to the other as closely as, as they could be. Now, when you disaggregate the data globally, you find that's less true. There are some places, and I don't know how else to say it, like the United States where we have carbon obesity, and there are other places in the world where they have, based on available technology, carbon starvation. But when you put all the numbers together, they're, they're in tandem. Now, when you look at world population growth through history, we really didn't get started in any big way until around 1800. Up until then, for millennia, we had added about 400,000 people a year, 400,000 people a year to the world population. Today, we add 80 million a year, 400,000 to 80 million. That's an extraordinary increase. And I'll just point out two things about it. One is uh, the reason it started in a big way around 1800 was because one of the most positive events in human history, children began surviving their childhood in great numbers, due to some extent to public health, modern medicine, but moreover to modern sanitation. Uh, many children simply didn't make it to age five until uh, your, your Californian, Ronald Reagan, I uh, had to get that in. Uh, the longest lived US president was John Adams, our second president. So if you could get past your early childhood years, several hundred years ago, you had a pretty good shot at a long life. But many children didn't survive their early years. So improvements in health resulted in rapid population growth. It's an unfortunate outcome from a very virtuous circumstance. The reason it tops out there in 2100 is not because anybody's predicting that. It's because you can't do any predictions any farther out than that. In order to make a reasonable prediction about what's going to happen, say, in 2200, you would have to have some sense of how many children your great, 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 great grandchildren are going to have. And nobody can figure that out. So you can't really look out more than you know, 80, 90 years in any responsible or meaningful way. But at this point, world population is continuing to grow. Although you wouldn't know it by reading a lot of the stories about it. You wouldn't know that it's still growing almost as rapidly as it ever has. 
Uh, one way, another way to look at uh, the impact of population on our planet is this, this little cartoon I kind of like. Uh, I think we have to take our world seriously, but try not to take ourselves too seriously. And so we try to try to have a little bit of a uh, little bit of humor in the process. And, hey, and I think hey, humanity John? is now starting to feel like that fish in that fishbowl. It's getting a little crowded in here. Hey, John, can I break yes. in for a second? Can you uh, make this full screen? People are having a little trouble reading. Oh, I'm text. so sorry. I will be happy to. My apologies for that. Let me, let me figure that out. Thanks for can you just press me. from the beginning button over on the left? Yeah, and I'll just have to hop. Thank you. And I'll, and I'll just hop through. Thanks for telling me. I appreciate it. Here we go. Uh, here is a quote that I'm particularly fond of. Uh, on the issue, uh, and it talks about, I won't read it, but it talks about the modern plague of overpopulation. But then, and that's pretty strong language. Plague is about as strong as you can get. And, and then it talks about what's lacking is not the knowledge, but consciousness, which almost seem like the same thing, but they're not, they're different. And the, the thing I really like about this quote is whose words these are. These are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1966 at a time, I might add, when world population was less than half of what it is today. And yet Dr. King referred to it as a plague, though that's his word. And then what he talked about was the difference between knowledge and consciousness. I am just old enough to remember uh, traveling through parts of the South in the car with my parents and seeing the whites only signs on the bathrooms. I think most people had some knowledge that this was wrong, but it took Dr. King and Rosa Parks and so many others, that some names we know, many we don't know, whose courage and whose sacrifices brought us from knowledge to consciousness. And I think the same is true of, of population growth. Uh, you can know the numbers, but somehow you have to be conscious of the impact as well before you can really hope to address it effectively. Dr. King's not the only one who talks about it and, and talks about overpopulation. Uh, here, just to give one example, is one of quite a few uh, national health officials in Africa who talk very openly about overpopulation. Dr. Apia refers to it as an undesirable condition where numbers of existing population exceed the carrying capacity of Earth, which I'll return to later. And she's very plain as, as an African and as a MD and as a health official, that rapid population growth in Africa, and not just in Africa, but notably in Africa, is making life very difficult for people. We all hear about climate change. I, I think the phrase climate chaos may capture it a little better than just change. Change sounds is just too, uh, too benign a word to describe what it's doing to our world. Uh, a cart, another cartoon where the speaker says, now for political and religious reasons, let's pretend none of these are related to overpopulation. And uh, sadly, that's often the case in terms of when people talk about food challenges, energy challenges, environmental crises, water crises. And note, this was an old, it's a fairly old cartoon. It says, get ready. Well, ready has arrived from many places, including much of California, the, the ready has arrived and we weren't ready. So who then is responsible for higher greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I, we've managed to identify the culprit here. Uh, it's this large stuffed bear. Unfortunately, it isn't this large stuffed bear who is driving all the cars and, and using all the energy. We know which species it is and we can't blame the bears for this one, it's us. As Pogo said, we have met the enemy and it is us. And when you look more specifically, for example, at population growth in the United States, and let me know, population growth is slowing a bit in the United States, but our population is still growing very substantially. And, and what, what is uh, driving that population growth? It's very interesting when you look at the numbers carefully, and we've done that. There are, in 2020, there were about 3.6 3 million births in the United States. According to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, about 37% were unintended. That's the latest percentage they have there. That means we had about 1.3 million unintended births in the United States. When you look at migration, net migration, 
adding and subtracting. You've got people emigrating to the United States legally. You've got people coming in without proper documentation. You've got people leaving, some of them who came here legally, some without documentation. You've got people who relocate to another country and you've got refugees, you've got asylees, but when you add and subtract all of those numbers uh, for 2019, which is the latest number we had available, uh, it's less than half of the number of unintended births in the United States. Now you're never gonna get unintended births down to zero, but it's important to note that's a very significant factor in US population growth and one that tends not to get much attention, unfortunately. What, what can we do about it? Well, I'm deliberately using this very boring stock picture of the nice pharmacy lady showing the other nice lady something or other, and that's just a stand in for modern contraception. It should be about as exciting as this picture, which is dull as dishwater. It should be a matter of folks just stopping at the CVS or what have you to pick up their prescription. That's the way it should be. Unfortunately, it often isn't that way. And I'll get to that in a moment. But I also wanna note that, let, let me, before I even get to this slide, let me say there has been a shameful lack of progress on male contraception. As has been pointed out, if men could get pregnant, birth control pills would be free and they would be bacon flavored. Uh, there is now an effort underway, a lot of it funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation because pharmaceutical companies can't make much money off male contraception, believe it or not. So the Gates Foundation has said, we'll front load the research, we'll pay for it, just develop the products. So maybe we'll see something soon there. But it's really interesting when you look at how women can address this, the various options they have. People, of course, are familiar with birth control pills. If you've got 10,000 women in the US using them, about 900 will get pregnant in a year. What's fascinating is with the newest methods, that number goes from 900 down to five. That's not a misprint, five. It's almost 200, they're almost 200 times more effective than birth control pills. Now, none of these methods are the right method for every woman. And again, men need to step up here and we need more methods for men. But it is extraordinary how effective the modern methods are. It's interesting that implants are more effective than tubal ligation and more effective than vasectomies. And the good thing about implants too is they're totally reversible. So they're an excellent method for younger people who don't want to be pregnant, but maybe in a few years do want to have a child. There's real progress being made on that front, but all the progress, oh, by the way, here is some improvement on male contraception. It's this new method. You just go into the washroom and you put your quarter in. And if you kind of look carefully at where that uh, punch lands, you'll see how it works. Uh, unfortunately, I only see the full screen. I hope somebody sees the humor in this. Uh, it causes all sorts of problems, not the least of being, being trauma, numbness, and loss of sanity. But it will, it will control births, that's for sure. Now, when you look globally at where we are and where we're heading, we're nearing 8 billion. We'll be there in a year or two. The UN does projections. They don't do predictions. And they run all the data every couple of years. And their, their best projection right now, their medium projection, is that we'll be at close to 11 billion by the end of the century. The blue line at the top is where we would be if family size stayed for the next rest of the century, right where it is today. We'd be up to close to 22 billion. Nobody really expects that to happen, but it's, it's a useful way of looking at it at least. The other two lines, the dark and lighter green lines, are also developed by the UN. And those are like what I call what if lines. What if every woman on earth had one half child more than the UN projects or fewer than the UN projects? And it just shows you how very small changes in family size can have an enormous difference. We go from about 11 billion to about 15 and a half billion with one half child more per woman. And similarly, we, we would essentially be back 
to where we were a few years ago by the end of the century with a slight reduction beyond what the UN projects. None of these are set in stone other than just the, the constant line. I know people who are worried about that bottom green line. They think we're gonna run out of people. I personally have not noted any people shortage. I suspect that if that ever happened in our, on our planet, People being industrious would figure out a way to work around it and solve it. Uh, but I think that if the world were a little less crowded, we'd be a little better off. And that's the focus of a lot of our work. Unfortunately, the circumstance for so many people, some of them here in the United States, but many, many hundreds of millions around the world is not a very benign one when it comes to contraception. These are two of the wives of an impoverished bricklayer in Nigeria. Uh, all, both very young, both have children. They live in the most populous nation in Africa. It's a very complex picture. Parts of Nigeria are making progress, parts are not. Uh, you, you can't sort of generalize about anything, including Africa or even specific nations within Africa often. There are trends and counter trends depending on where you're looking. But when you look at the big picture, Virtually, and you add and subtract all the rest of the world, what you're left with is to sort of borrow from the late Tim Russert, who used to say about politics, Ohio, 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 it's Africa, Africa, Africa. The population growth that is projected for Africa literally amounts to all of the net population growth that the UN projects through, through 2100. Again, some countries rising, some countries getting smaller, but the total numbers are still growing very rapidly. Africa has a lot of problems today at 1 billion people. The UN projects it'll grow to more than 4 billion by the end of the century. And if there's one thing we learned to our sorrow in the 20th century is there's no upper limit to human misery. There really isn't. You would think there would be, but there isn't. So what can we do about this? Well, again, when you look at the numbers, there are 218 million women in LMICs, which is low and middle income countries, just some jargon, uh, who have an unmet need for modern contraception. What that means very specifically, these women do not want to be pregnant right now, but they face barriers to contraception. If we want to address population growth and if we want to improve the, the lives of these women, we need to remove the barriers that prevent them from exercising their right to choose smaller families. The challenge is that we know how to do it, but there are so many barriers. Thankfully, one of the first things that President Biden did when he took office was to lift the terrible global gag rule, which was first initiated by President Reagan, reaffirmed by the first President Bush, lifted by President Clinton, reimposed by the second President Bush, lifted by President Obama, reimposed by Trump, and lifted by President Biden. And what this did was it said that family planning organizations that got US funds couldn't have any funds if they not, not used US funds to perform or promote or, or advise on abortion, but rather used anybody's money. For example, if the Dutch wanted to give them some money to do it even if our money was kept isolated from that, it didn't matter. Now, the supporters of this policy would claim and profess that they're doing it because they're against abortion. Well, some Stanford researchers looked at what happened during the Bush two years. That dotted line you see there was when George, the second George Bush reinstated the Mexico City policy, also called the global gag rule. They're the same thing. And what happened was, abortion rates in sub-Saharan nations nearly tripled. If you were designing a policy and you wanted to increase infant mortality, increase maternal mortality, increase unplanned pregnancy, increase unplanned births, increase abortion, increase unsafe abortion, this is the policy you would use because that's exactly what it does. Now, President Biden, to his credit, has rescinded it. We now uh, are working hard on a bill that is now passed the House as part of a bigger bill uh, that will soon, we hope, be pending in the Senate. 
that would prevent any future president from reimposing the global gag rule. Every single Democratic senator, except for one, that's, that would be Joe Manchin, supports this bill. Every single Democratic member of the House supports the bill. Every single Republican member of the House, I'm sorry to say, opposed the bill. And every single Republican in the Senate, except for two, opposed this effort. Those two being uh, Senator Murkowski of Alaska and Senator Collins of Maine. Uh, that should hopefully give us a narrow majority. And even if you think of the problems with the filibuster, this bill has been attached to a money bill, an appropriations bill, and sooner or later something has to happen or the government just shuts down permanently. Uh, McConnell seems to be up to his old tricks right now, but we'll see how it plays out. We are definitely optimistic that we can get this through. I, I want to note that the champion in the House of this bill is Barbara Lee and uh, from the Bay Area. She is the absolute champion on this and so many other things. And the good thing for us is to borrow from the musical Hamilton, Barbara Lee will be in the room when it happens. And I know that she will fight very hard to keep this language in, although she's gonna have some very tough opponents as usual. Now, around the world, there are programs that are so effective. This is actually a photo from Pakistan showing a, an Afghan refugee in a, a clinic where she's learning about family planning. Even in nations that you might be surprised to learn about, there are effective family planning programs. Often they're under assault, under attack, but many uh, programs exist in Islamic nations and in other places. And sometimes you have to recognize certain cultural circumstances, but as long as it enables women to be able to exercise their right to choose smaller families, uh, you work with what you've got in this world. The challenges are real, but they are definitely solvable. And again, just to sort of run the numbers here, uh, that number at the top left, the United States uh, this year is investing about 600 million dollars in international family planning. We are the global leader on this. If, uh, if you see what that does, it, it prevents 12 million unintended pregnancies, prevents millions of unplanned births, uh, prevents the death of many women. We need to get more money appropriated. The only people in this country who are, if you will, allowed to print money are the people in Congress acting as a whole. And so our other major goal, in addition to getting the, the global gag rule rescinded, abolished, is to get more money for international family planning. The House has put about a 37% increase in this year. The Senate hasn't acted yet, but I would certainly encourage you to be in touch with your legislators and let them know that you want them to act to ban the global gag rule and you want them to act to provide more money for family planning. Uh, if none of us ask them, they won't hear from any of us. If enough of us ask, then we'll get noticed and we'll get heard. Uh, another cartoon, back Earth Day. I remember the first Earth Day, 1970. There were about 3.7 billion. Uh, now we're heading up and up and up. What are we going to do about it? But the character says, well, at least this cartoon's on recycled paper. I mean, you've got to take small victories where you can find them, but Clearly what we're doing now isn't anywhere near enough to avert utter catastrophes. So I just wanna to start to wrap up and, and throw a question uh, and try to answer a question that I get a lot, which is how many people can the earth support? It's, it's an interesting question. And it, like a lot of things in life depends. For example, uh, you could fit every person on earth into Los Angeles County. This is what it would look like basically. And if one of those people were to get thirsty or want to take a walk or maybe even know to go to the bathroom, you have trouble. Uh, people will tell me sometimes, you know, uh, there's a lot of, I've flown over the United States and I see lots of empty land. And I say, well, I've flown over the US too. And I've never seen any of that empty land you talk about. All the land I see is filled. It's filled with deserts and mountains and lakes and trees and streams. And all of it's filled with something. 
And, and it's not empty. The fact that we haven't crammed ourselves into every nook and cranny yet doesn't mean it's empty. So, you know, that's not maybe the best way to think about this stuff. Uh, now, if everybody on earth ate the typical American diet, and yes, I don't know if Carl's Jr. is still serving this delight, but it was, I didn't make it up. They were selling it at one point, the cheeseburger, hot dog, potato chip sandwich. Uh, don't forget the pickles and the, the ketchup. Uh, pickles, I think you're okay. But if everybody on earth wanted to eat the diet Americans eat, or at least the typical American does, the typical American diet, two billion people would get food and five plus billion wouldn't get any. If everybody ate the diet typical of the Indian subcontinent, traditional diet, then there'd be enough calories to go around uh, in terms of food. Unfortunately, the fact that there are enough to go around doesn't mean they always get around, but it makes a difference. Now, if we all live the way the absolute poorest people do in parts of Africa, on a daily search for water, for food, for anything, we could cram 40 billion people onto the planet with this way of life. So the point is, when you try to figure out how many people the Earth can support, it depends, as, as a demographer named Dr. Joel Cohen has pointed out, it depends on how you want to live as an individual, how you want everybody else to live, not just people either, other critters. And what about all the people and other critters who aren't here yet? These are value questions, and, and it takes more than an Excel spreadsheet to answer them, although the data does matter. One of the things that I alluded to earlier that we're working on a great deal is getting rid of this horrible global gag rule, which is just so pernicious and has destroyed so many millions of lives and added to population growth. It's a way of addressing environmental concerns and reproductive rights concerns at the same time by empowering women and by reducing population pressures. And I would encourage you to help us let Congress know it's a bad idea. You can do that lots of ways. If you text, you can text POP Connect to 52886. I'll leave this up as I shrink back. Uh, or you can go to our website, uh, popconnect.org, and you can find ways to connect with us there as well. Or if you like, if you poke around a little bit, or if you just remember it, you can always send me an email at john, J-O-H-N, the old fashioned way, at popconnect, popconnect.org, and I'll be happy to get back to you myself. Human population growth is the one global challenge where we know how to meet the challenge. Compared to many things on earth, it's not that expensive. It costs $25 to transform a woman's life in terms of the family planning needs that she has in a given year. And this is about enabling hundreds of millions of women to have the lives they want to have. Not what I want for them or what you want for them, but what they want for themselves. Overwhelmingly, when women have more choices, more education, more power, they choose smaller families. And when they do so, they improve the lives for their own family and they improve the lives for all of us on this planet. So with that, I will see if I can figure out a way to shrink this back, uh, and if that's okay, and see if there are any questions or comments. And can you stop sharing? I sure can, it's going away. It went away. There you go. And Alex, are you going to run the question and answer? Yes. Ah. Uh, okay, so I don't know whether it's an extended question or a comment, uh, but uh, I agree with uh, your conclusions uh, regarding uh, uh, that it is desired uh, to reduce the population uh, in the countries, in some African countries where it's too high. Uh, and uh, the ways that uh, you're proposing for this, this, this all are good recommendations. But uh, I'd like to challenge you a little bit on when, when you say that uh, what science, ba science said uh, that uh, behind uh, our greenhouse gas emissions is the population growth. Uh, and uh, the, this is not what seems that uh, what science uh, says. 
because uh, when Dr. King said about this plug of population, uh, he was right based uh, on the data that was available when he lived, but that was the time of the highest fertility rate. And after that, it only went down and uh, it, it keeps going down. Uh, but what is more important, the situation is very different in different regions. Uh, and uh, for instance, um, the countries that are, uh, if you divide population by half, uh, then uh, uh, one half of this population is responsible for 16% of global emission, emissions. And another half is responsible for remaining 84%. Uh, uh, so it's not all about population. It's about lifestyle, it's about technologies, uh, it's about our choices, uh, and uh, also the countries in which the population is not growing that fast or even declining, but uh, these are also the countries who can uh, uh, give the greatest hope uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by uh, switching to clean technologies, for instance, and uh, doing all these other changes. So uh, what would be your uh, comment, comment on this? Sure, a, a couple of things here. Let, let's sort of start at one end of the uh, telescope, if you will. Uh, Let's, let's assume, uh, again, this sort of gets back to where I started at the beginning of the talk with, we hold these truths to be self-evident. If, if one starts from the premise that every woman everywhere should be empowered, should have access to the information, the services, the opportunities to live the life she chooses to lead, we now have an abundance of evidence that that results in sub-replacement fertility. That is to say, the replacement rate, rate fertility is about two children per couple. Uh, in societies where women are truly empowered, you end up with a, a family size of you know, 1.6, 1.7, maybe even lower than that. So even leaving aside the, the benefits or detriments attendant to population growth, I don't think that puts us in a position where we want to uh, try to put barriers in the way of women leading the lives they choose to lead. Incidentally, incentives to once people, once women get to that point, incentives have almost nothing to do with it. People don't go for that. You know, people don't want a few extra dollars or even a few thousand extra dollars. Anybody who's ever had kids knows that that's a bad bargain from day one. But looking at it just from one other aspect, I do want to agree with you that one shouldn't generalize about this complex planet. There are over 200 nations. There are a handful that are already declining. There are nearly 100 that are at or below replacement rate. And there are just over 100 that are above replacement rate at varying levels. But let's just look at one nation where the population is already declining, and that is Japan. The long-term economic studies in Japan show that in the future, the gross domestic product of Japan is going to decline because of its population decline. But it also shows that the gross, gross domestic, the, the per capita income of people is going to continue to rise. Now, when you look at quality of life, I don't think GDP tells you all that much. You know, if Bill Gates moved onto my block, I wouldn't be able to go out and buy a sailboat, you know, if I wanted one or what have you. Uh, the GDP of the block would go way up, but it wouldn't change my circumstance one way or the other. And if he moved out, it wouldn't change it. So I think what we need to look at, and I'll just, like, we'll just add one more tag on here, uh, and that is you do need a productive and healthy economy. And we produced a book on the subject, which is free. It's called The Good Crisis. The Good Crisis. It's free for free download. Uh, if you want a paper copy, there's a little cost to it, but the downloads are free. You can go to our website for the good crisis, or you can type the good crisis into Google. It should come up. It's free. Uh, and, and what we did was we looked at and, and used the experts on this. And what they said was to have a productive economy anywhere, you need a productive workforce. And the age at which women have children can matter more than how many they have. A simple example, 
Sarah has uh, twins on her 17th birthday. Sue has twins, but on her 34th birthday. Uh, Sue has actually skipped an entire human generation. So education is critical. Certainly, by and large, unless you have a society where there are intense cultural strictures, as is the case in some oil-rich countries in the Middle East, generally people, uh, the more wealthy a country has, the smaller the families. But the problem is that many countries, particularly in the global south, are caught in a poverty trap. Their GDP may be going up 1% a year, uh, but their fertility rate, their family size, their population is growing up 2%. So they keep falling farther and farther behind. You have countries like Chad and Niger where women have more than six children each. And so it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big challenge across the board. Okay, uh, uh, Dana, Jerry. Now, wait a minute, now that message doesn't make sense. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I remember learning this formula once upon a time, I equals P times A times T, which translates to the impact is population times affluence times technology. So it, you know, the damage that's harm done by people is not just a matter of how many there are. Um, for example, uh, in the United States, we have about 4% of the world's population, but we have about 20, we, our impact on the world is about 25% terms of resources and pollutions and so forth. So, we're, so what this leads to is you get some people saying population is the problem and, and some people saying consumption is a problem. How do you reconcile those two? Well, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, it's not an either or proposition. And of course, that's exactly the point of the, the I equals PAT equation, which was co-developed by uh, one of our founders, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, and John Holdren, who went on to be President Obama's science advisor. Uh, these three factors, population, affluence, and technology, interact. The more people you have, the more impact you have. Uh, affluence, at least so far, it seems like the more affluent people are, the more impact. Although I think there is at least cause for extremely mild optimism on that front. I, I don't know about you, but... I'm not at a point in life where I want to accumulate more stuff. I'm spending more time, my wife and I, trying to figure out how to get rid of stuff than, than anything else. Uh, technology is a very interesting wild card because it can work both ways. Uh, if the technology um, involves buying a giant uh, gas emitting SUV, then it's a negative impact. If the technology involves, uh, say, uh, an electric powered vehicle, it can be a positive impact. I say can be because up in North Dakota, they, they are proud that their, that their electric powered vehicles are powered by coal power. They advertise that fact. And of course, even, uh, even a Tesla has to drive on an asphalt road. So there are real challenges. One of the things that, that, that often gets overlooked is so much of our carbon emissions are baked in, literally baked into our society. Even if you are doing everything you can to be a low emitter, you're still living in a society with roads and bridges and, and an electric grid uh, for public service. Uh, how did your food get there? Who made the vehicle that it came in? Uh, you know, who is powering the houses of the people who grow the food? It's, it's a very complex thing. I would never suggest that population, addressing population is a panacea. I would just suggest that it's an often overlooked factor. That I would say that relative to the amount of attention it gets, it's under noticed. That I don't wanna take anything away from focus on renewables, wind power, solar, shutting down coal plants, uh, eating farther down the food chain, all those things are very important. But for all the discussion of that, there's remarkable silence often when it comes to population. Yeah, uh, I, I also wanted to say something about what you said about organizations not discussing it. I remember some quite a few years ago, probably about 2025 or so years ago, the Sierra Club had a discussion about whether to have a policy on it. and. <clears throat> And uh, I guess it was a heated debate and eventually they decided the best thing to do was to say nothing. Yeah, I, look, I, I'm a big fan of the Sierra Club. They do a lot of incredibly important work. There are 
so many members around the country working in their communities to try to do good things. Uh, and uh, certainly any environmental group that would like to step in and be involved, we welcome. I've had many conversations with my friends at the Sierra Club and we certainly have many members of our organization who are also members of the Sierra Club and other environmental groups. Uh, we can't all work on everything and we're not all going to agree on everything, but uh, there are definitely people who are trying to do the right thing according to their lights. And I include the Sierra Club in that as, as I do other environmental groups. And then there are people who are just out there to do harm and ill. And I try not to get annoyed when my friends don't agree with me uh, because that's just the nature of life. Okay, thank you. Hmm. And there, there are some groups in our own country actually that you know, have a different idea about family size. I'm thinking of my neighbor who has seven kids, seven sons. And, um, and she is a college graduate and so is her husband and they're, you know, techies, but there you go. And because they belong to a religious group that believes in that, um, yeah. Well, when, when you see them, and this may irritate somebody, but I'll say it anyway, when you see them, uh, certainly, I know that humanists, uh, from what I know, your neighbors are showing that diversity. When you take all Americans together, Americans have an average of about 1.7 children. So I think we really notice it when somebody has five, six, seven children these days because it's so unusual. Uh, there are many, many people, by contrast, who are choosing to be child free. And I've talked to many of our members who said, uh, that they decided not to bring children into the world, but instead they decided to adopt children. And I think that is a wonderful and admirable thing. Uh, Dr. King, in all those years ago, talked specifically about the tragedy of unwanted children. And I think, uh, I don't believe in heaven, but there's certainly a special place in my heart for people who find room in their hearts uh, to take on children who have problems. And, and to dedicate their lives to making the world better. I, if I could just switch back to one thing that I want to mention about the IPAT formula, in, in impact equals populations times affluence times technology. I, I would not presume to, to uh, step on the toes of the formulators of that, but I think there's a, there are many other factors. The one I would probably throw in there starts with a C and that's culture. I think culture can make a difference. Certainly there are more people these days who are aware of climate impacts and that's having an impact on our culture. And I think there are people who are switching to eating further down the food chain in part for health, but also because of new cultural understandings of the impact of, of uh, animal, uh, of mass animal production. So culture can change societies as well. And sometimes I think it's, it's both hard to define, but maybe our biggest hope. I have another question. Can he hear me? I ask him. Sure uh, can. Yes. I, I guess I'm wondering about what you think the impact of COVID is going to have on world population. Uh, the direct impact will be negligible. Uh, I mean, if you look at the numbers, we're adding 80 million people uh, to, to the planet each year. Uh, you know, when, when, when the pandemic hit 100 years ago, uh, and who knows what the final toll is going to be for COVID, but at this point, the, the impact of the 1917-18 pandemic was far greater in terms of deaths than COVID at this point. Uh, you see this very short two or three year dip and then the number the, went right back on track. Uh, the other element of it that's really interesting, and of course we, we don't know the origins of, of the, exactly how COVID came to pass, but what we do know is that over the last several generations, most of the diseases that have emerged have been zoonotic. That is, they jump from animals 
to people, whether it's Lyme disease, whether it's HIV, whether it's SARS, the, the SARS that we knew about a few years ago, whether it's Ebola and so many others, they've shifted from animals to humans. And that happens because uh, there's sort of two similar but not identical theories about that. One is that we go into an area which was essentially wild and uh, the, the, the viruses, the pathogens just sort of jump to us. The other theory is that we go in and destroy those areas and the natural hosts for these animals, uh, creatures that have over the millennia learned how to balance with them as best they could uh, because viruses, it's a pretty, viruses better not kill off all their hosts or they go out of business. Uh, that though we kill off their natural hosts and so they're kind of like the Hilton is shut down. So they go to the Motel 6 and we're the Motel 6. And, and virologists are run around with their hair on fire because viruses mutate a million times faster than do mammalian species. And we are going into these areas and destroying wild areas. And if you want to look at this tremendous increase in diseases we didn't hear of when I was a kid, it traces directly back to that. It's not yet clear, however, if COVID falls into that category. It's been very hard to get real data on that because of a variety of factors, including lack of co cooperation from the Chinese. Emma, I see you've got your hand up. You want to un unmute yourself? Emma? Going once, going twice. Okay. Um, uh, okay, okay. Now I can unmute. I need I need you to unmute me first, and then I can unmute myself. Okay, so speaking of uh, education for women, I'm wondering with internet, with all these online classes, you know, I would think that uh, education is cost a lot less than before and can be more prevalent than before. Has anybody, has any organizations trying to push education for women, especially women who are low income and in, you know, uh, in poor countries? It, you know, I, I, I'm hesitating only because this is such a complex world and you've got, again, more than 200 countries at all sorts of different stages of development. Uh, one of the interesting things I learned a few years ago uh, in Mexico, for example, and I didn't know this at the time, people in Mexico speak more than 60 different languages and dialects. And when family planning workers go out into remote areas in Mexico, they take picture books, uh, not just because people are not literate in some places, but because they don't even use Spanish. And so you have... In some countries, you have so many different languages and dialects that are spoken. You know, the, certainly there, there have been a variety of useful and effective ways that that's being used. It's one tool in a kind of large toolbox. Another tool that's used very effectively are uh, these uh, radio and TV soap operas that are very, very popular in uh, particularly in some develop, less developed countries where uh, they introduce characters into the plot line that, uh, that actually um, help to people understand how family planning can work. The real key here, more than anything else, and, and uh, a doctor and writer named Twinkle Wande, uh, who's at Harvard, has written a lot about and how the key to it is is really finding ways to work with people on a very personal basis and understanding the local culture. The most effective programs are when women who look like and dress like the women uh, and cook like the women in a given area go in and cultivate relationships and have private conversations. That's the single most important tool. Certainly the internet can help. Let's remember there are you know, there are a lot of places on earth where people still don't have access to any kind of digital technology. Uh, they don't have running water, they don't have indoor plumbing, they don't have 
any of the things that we sort of pick up. So it can be helpful, but I think that basic, old-fashioned, personal relationships are still the key more than anything else. So uh, my question has to do with your uh, comment earlier. You say that uh, the birth control has a lot to do with the education of women. When I heard that, I assume education means a general education, but that it seems that you really meant how to educate women to have birth control. Is that right? Well, it's, a, it, well, it's let me put it this way. It, certainly, the, the, if, you, if I could do one thing to address the global population challenge, I, somebody said, you get to do one thing, cost is no consideration. It would be to ensure that every woman on this planet has as much education as possible, as she wants, and certainly enough so that she can function as an independent person within her society. That would be my number one goal. The advantage to focusing on birth control is that often the nations, the poor nations are so resource starved in terms of for one reason or another. It can be because they're poor, it can be because they're corrupt, it can be because of you know, all kinds of different reasons. Uh, and corruption certainly isn't something that wealthy nations are unfamiliar with. Birth control can be a way to short circuit that process. I would rather it not be short circuited, but it costs $10 as much to educate a woman as it does to provide her with family planning. And the way I look at it is if there are 218 million women in poor countries who don't want to be pregnant today, right now, and who are open to using modern contraception, it should be made available to them. And that's not in any way to say that broader education isn't important. It's just to say that those women have an immediate need uh, and that need should be met. But I certainly think the more we invest in education, the better. When Americans are asked what percent of the federal budget goes for foreign aid, they usually say about 26%. In fact, it's less than 1%. And of that 1% of the federal budget that goes for foreign aid, less than 1% of it goes for family planning. So there's a lot of room to do more here. You know, John, one of the, one of the things I, I find myself concerned about, there's, there's talk, a lot of talk that as, as education increases, it, the birth rate goes down. It, that, that seems kind of self-limiting, though. Um, also, I think there's some cultures that just, as you mentioned earlier, just want large families, or that like large, large families. And I have a feeling that that's, that means there's going to be an increased number of people who grew up in a large family and think that's the norm. I wonder if that puts a lower limit on, on, on how much we can expect from education. There's been an interesting uh, flip in the last 30 years or so, 30 or 40 years, over the last 30 to 40 years. 30 or 40 years ago, the more developed countries were pushing for population, lower population numbers. Mm -hmm. And the less developed countries were not. It's flipped. Now there are many. Uh, as I think, I think it might have been Michael pointed out earlier, uh, if I'm not mis misstating his point, uh, there are certainly le more developed countries that are already seeing their population go down or are nearing that point or can see it coming who are concerned because they don't know how they're going to have a healthy society. I think it's quite possible to do that. But leaving that aside, most, most countries that have less in the way of income, less developed, are now, have now recognized that rapid population growth is getting in the way of almost everything they're trying to do, that they can't grow their economies fast enough to bring people up to a sustainable, a, a livable level. Now, again, every country is different. If you go to certain countries uh, in, in Africa, for example, that are uh, uh, heavily Muslim and pretty much fundamentalist in their view of their religion. And certainly not all Muslims take a fundamentalist perspective on that, but some do, as do some Christians. 
one of the techniques that's used there is the ministers, the, the religious leaders, will tell the men, because that's the way it works, that the men have a duty under the, the Quran to protect the health of their wives, often plural, and children. And one way they can fulfill that duty is by making sure that their wives don't get pregnant every year. So spacing out births can work. There's another, there are other programs where, for example, to keep young girls in school, a uh, young girl goes to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday afternoon, if she attended every day, she takes a market basket of food home. Now it's unfortunate that that's what it takes to get her father to keep her in school, but if it works, do it. So there are certainly some countries where any effort to talk about population growth uh, is anathema, but I've done a lot of research and we work with a lot of people around the world. And I would say clearly the vast majority of less well-off nations recognize that overpopulation is a problem and talk about it a great deal. So it's certainly uh, more opportunity out there than one might think. 